The Story of Cynthia There are shades of a sort. Death does not end it all. Cynthia had only recently been buried by the roadside, a quick, cheap funeral headed up by the slaves she had freed in her will. But I seemed to see her leaning over me as I tossed and turned in my empty bed, unable to sleep. Her eyes, those eyes that first grabbed me and trapped me, those bright blue eyes, such fine eyes, they were the same. Her hair was tumbled up as it was when she died, as it was when we buried her, all tousled golden curls pinned over her head. But those once perfect golden curls were singed and burned around the edges, the marks of the funeral pyre clear to see. Her dress was half burned, sitting charred against her side where the funeral pyre had done its work. The blue beryl ring she always wore, that big ring whose marks could still be seen on my face, had been eaten by the fire. The stone had fallen out as the bronze setting had melted and her fingers were brittle and stripped down to the bone. Her lips, that I had so often loved to kiss, had been worn away by the waters of the river, but I could see from her expression that she had certainly not forgotten me. Sleeping soundly, are you, my love? she said, her voice dripping sarcasm and contempt. Have you forgotten me already? She reached out a bony finger gently to stroke my cheek. Have you forgotten all those nights I let down a rope to you from my window and you snuck into my room, glancing about left and right to make sure no one had seen you wandering around the Subura? Or the nights we threw caution to the wind and made love at the crossroads, breast to breast under our cloaks? Have you found a replacement for me already, so soon? How could I forget you? I shuddered under her brittle touch, but at the same time I was weeping to see her like this. How could you think I could ever have forgotten you? You were my muse, you were all I could think about, all I could write about. Pfft, she snorted. All those poems about how temperamental, cruel and unfaithful I was, you mean? I think you should forget about those. And I hardly think it's true that you always thought of me and no other. But if you remember me so well, and I meant so much to you, how do you explain that sham of a funeral you barely honoured me with? I was silent, but she carried on relentlessly. You abandoned me as I was dying. You weren't there to call out my name. Maybe I could have stayed just a few seconds longer if you had. At my funeral, there wasn't so much as a watchman to shake a split cane to frighten away the evil spirits, never mind a proper rattle. And as my body was jostled about on the way to a hastily lit pyre, a broken tile cut my face. She turned her head to show me a deep gash down one side. There was very little blood, just a gaping hole in the skin of her cheek where the lower part of the loose skin flapped down over her face. Just because you want a simple poor man's funeral, which for some reason you delighted in telling me about, does not mean that's what I wanted. And where were you anyway? Were you at my graveside in your black funeral robe, weeping for me? No. If you were so embarrassed to be seen outside the city gates, you could have ordered the undertakers to walk more slowly and followed along at a distance. You could have paid someone to put nard on my pyre or at least scatter it with cheap hyacinths. Did I mean nothing to you, in the end? I tried to respond, but the words stuck in my throat. It was true. I hadn't been there. I had paid off the undertakers to dispose of her body quickly and efficiently, left the former and current slaves of her household to walk with it and honour the spirits at her tomb, and I had left. I didn't know what to say. But Cynthia was not yet finished. As if all this wasn't bad enough, she declared, really warming to her theme. As if all this wasn't insult enough to disturb my spirit and allow me no rest. On top of everything, you have my murderer still among your household. I lay in stunned silence. Murderer? 
It had happened two weeks earlier. Cynthia had gone to Lanuvium, supposedly to take part in the fertility rites of Juno Sospita. Ha! Fertility rites! As if she wasn't in the habit of visiting the old woman several times a year to make sure she wouldn't be fertile. She had gone there with some other man, some idiot with more money than sense. I heard them leave, Cynthia driving the cart like a madwoman, hanging over the end of the shaft with the reins loosely gripped in her hands, shouting and laughing. Well, I thought, fine then. She has gone off with her new tag-along. I will find ways to entertain myself. And so I had my man Ligdemus bring Phyllis and Taya over to my house, two rather lovely girls whose profession you would never guess to look at them. They have no sores or scars, just the tiniest, most discreet brand sitting under their dresses. It was a beautiful, warm evening, and peaceful, with only the sound of the chirping cicadas and the distant murmur of the nighttime traffic from the city streets to disturb us. We set up three couches in the courtyard garden and settled down together. Ligdemus acted as cupbearer, keeping our wine cups well topped up and mixed with only a small amount of water. Magnus the Dwarf came to play the boxwood flute for us, and Phyllis danced with castanets. Taya devoted her attention entirely to me. Suddenly we heard a commotion from the front of the house, the front door slamming and shouting voices. Cynthia burst into the courtyard in a fury, the door slave hovering nervously and ineptly behind her. Her hair hung loose about her shoulders and her face was contorted with rage as she swept towards the couches, screaming bloody murder at anyone who dared get in her way. Nomas, her body woman, trailed in behind her, looking ashamed and embarrassed at this ridiculously over-the-top display. Cynthia flung herself first at Phyllis, then at Taya, tearing at their soft faces with her fingernails. The neighbours on both sides woke up and started yelling at us to be quiet, only adding to the general cacophony. Phyllis and Taya fled, their hair flying loose behind them, clutching their thin dresses to their chests, and took refuge in the taverna down the street, where their several regular customers would provide them a warmer welcome. Cynthia slapped me hard across the face, that big ring of hers catching my cheek and leaving a big purple bruise that would last for weeks and then turned her attention to Ligdemus, rooting him out from under the couch where he had hidden. You, she shouted, you organised this, you worthless, ungrateful! Please, master, cried Ligdemus, raising his eyes to me even as Cynthia gripped his hair with her left hand to pull his head back and stretch his neck, giving her plenty of room to strike him with her right. Please tell her, it's not my fault! Drunk, sleepy and confused, I raised my hands to the heavens as if to tell him, what could I do? I was as powerless in front of this onslaught as he was. He's mine, screamed Cynthia right in Ligdemus' face. He's mine and no other woman shall have him. I'm yours, I swear, Cynthia, I'm yours, I protested, throwing myself to the ground and grabbing her feet in supplication, washing them with my tears. Cynthia finally let go of Ligdemus, who scampered away to the atrium, where Nomas offered him a cup of my wine and a comforting arm. "'How will you prove it to me?' Cynthia demanded of me. "'I'll wash myself clean of any trace of another woman. I'll wash out all the sheets. I'll stay in the house and only go out for essentials. I'll spend all my time just waiting for you,' I wailed in desperation." Cynthia drew herself up straight, seeming mollified. He, she said, pointing furiously at Ligdemus. He must be sold. Let him drag double chains around his ankles through the silver loads in the mines. I do not want to see him here again. I nodded mutely and dismissed the miserable-looking Ligdemus with a wave of my hand. He, shaking, was led away by Nomas to some back part of the house, and I heard her calling for Chef to make him a hot drink. My attention was completely focused on Cynthia, who led me to our bed, ripped off the sheets that had been polluted by the presence of another woman, and pulled me right down onto the bare couch to make up our quarrel in the usual way. <laughs>
Afterwards, as we both raised ourselves up to drink some fresh wine and recover our clothes, she bent down and gripped my face firmly in both her hands. She stared right into my eyes and repeated once more, You're mine. You're mine, she said again, as once more her hands gripped my face. Only this time, the fingers were worn down to the bone and her eyes stared out of a sunken face, her charred hair hanging down across her exposed cheekbone. What happened? I whispered, afraid of the answer. The wine was pale, too pale, she said. Break open Nomas pots and you'll find the traces of her poisons in the potsherds. But it wasn't her idea, I'm sure of it. It was Ligdemus. He was the one who put her up to it. Prepare a white-hot iron for him and you'll soon get the truth out of him. What do you want me to do? I asked. First, brand and sell Ligdemus. And buy my slaves from Nomas. Like a fool, I freed her in my will. How could I know she'd bring it about? And she is abusing all of my loyal slaves. My old nurse Petali was chained to a block of wood for bringing garlands to my tomb, and Lalagi was whipped for daring to stand up for me. Buy them, free them, help them. I nodded shakily, glancing uncomfortably towards the back of the house where Ligdemus slumbered peacefully, unaware. And burn your poems about me, Cynthia continued relentlessly. What? I cried out, really disturbed now. Why? You will live on forever in my words. As what? Cynthia demanded, moving back from me and crossing her bony arms across her singed chest. As a faithless whore, a flighty nobody you amused yourself with for a while. A pretty but empty-headed thing? No. Burn them. Burn them all. But you will be forgotten, when you could have been remembered for a thousand years, two thousand. Give me a simple memorial like anyone else. I don't need eternal life through poetry. Just a stone over my grave that says, To the divine spirits of the dead, here lies Cynthia the Golden. And she shook the blackened remains of her golden hair in my face, still smarting from where she had struck me two weeks before. And you, she carried on, you will remember me. Look for me in your dreams, the dreams that come through the sacred gates of sleep. At night we spirits wander, let loose on the world, free to find those we love and offer them comfort, or not. The great black dog is let out of his cage and he prowls the streets with us, shaking his three heads at the sleeping homes of the living. But as the dawn approaches, he howls, calling us back to him through the night, and we must return to the emptiness below. The ferryman takes us back across the waters of Leith, the river of forgetting, and we are once again empty shadows without thought or form. I will never forget you, I said, as she grabbed my chin in her bony hands again. I will build you a tombstone and hang it with garlands, I will punish those who killed you, I will burn my verses, and I will be faithful to you and only you for as long as I live. I made the rash promises in a state of terror at the spectre looming before me, with one hand on my chin and the other somewhere even more delicate. I fully intended to keep at least half of them. But she laughed then, and the laughter was even more terrifying than her anger had been. Oh, let some other woman have you for now if she wants, she said, darkly, ominously. Have Phyllis and Taya come over and frolic with them in the garden. Or get some other girl, some Lesbia or Adelia or a Corinna. Spend what time you can with them, enjoying their living bodies. Kiss their sweet flesh and hold their warm forms, for soon, soon. What? I rasped in increasing terror. Soon I'll have you, she said, leaning over me without touching me and staring once more into my eyes. <laughs>
Soon I alone will hold you. You'll be with me, and bone on mingled bone I'll grind. I tried to reach out to embrace her, but somewhere outside a dog howled. My arms grasped nothing but air, and her shadow slipped away. The End Welcome back to Creepy Classics, the podcast retelling and discussing ancient, medieval and early modern ghost stories. Uh, I'm Juliette Harrison. This is based on one of my favourite ancient ghost stories, which is a poem by the love poet Propertius. Uh, It's poem 4.7, that means it's the seventh poem in book four. Um, It's actually based on two poems. Cynthia's ghost appears in 4.7 and then... 4.8 4.8 tells the story of Cynthia finding Propertius with these other two girls and flying into a rage and yelling at Ligdemus the slave. So they appear in the kind of inverted commas wrong chronological order um, in the book of poetry. We meet the, the ghost, we're told that Cynthia has died, and then in the next poem she's alive again. Um Many different explanations have been put forward by various scholars for why Propertius has organised the poems in this way. Um, Personally, I think it's a mystery style format. Um, Cynthia was alive last we heard of her in book three. They broke up at the end of book three. 4.7 reveals that she's dead. They seem to have got back together because she keeps saying she was faithful in that poem. Um, But she's dead. She says she's been murdered by Ligdemus and Nomas. And then 4.8 explains why. Um, So I I think, personally, that's why they're in that order, that it sets up this mystery that, you know, why, how has she died? Has she been murdered? Why has she been murdered? And then we see her flying into a rage at Ligdemus in the following poem, which explains why he has supposedly worked with this other slave to kill her. Uh, There is also an earlier poem where Propertius sets out his wishes for his own funeral, which I mentioned briefly, uh, which is 2.13b. I've sort of semi-quoted quite a lot of the original poems in the text. Um, I've tried to keep particularly the first and last lines of 4.7 and various other kind of more or less direct, obviously translated, um, quotations from the Latin. Um, They are really, really... um, fascinating poems to say Propertius is one of my favourites Catullus is my other favourite Latin love poet Um, so Propertius is one of several Latin love poets who writes these love poems these elegies Uh, the others they're all mostly from the first century BCE into the beginning of the first century CE Uh, presumably there were other love poets writing at other times but their work hasn't survived this group from roughly the same period of a few decades um, have have survived. Um, so this is uh, Catullus, as I say, is one of my absolute favourites. Some love poems by Horace, although he didn't write so many. Um, Ovid, Tibullus and Sulpicia. And Sulpicia, who is one of the very, very few women from the ancient world whose writing we have, um, her poems are collected with the poems of Tibullus. So the, the books of poetry came out as being written by Tibullus and then there are these handful of poems written by Sulpicia among Tibullus's collection. And I've used some of their mistresses' names at the end of the story. Um, so they, they write about these characters who may or may not be based on real people. How much of their work is autobiographical, how much is fictional is very unclear. Catullus, we think, is at least partly autobiographical. Catullus's mistress Lesbia uh, has been identified with a real woman, with Clodia Pulchra, uh, who's the sister of Clodius, who was an important figure uh, toward the end of the Roman Republic, a political figure. And there are hints in his poems that suggest he's talking about Clodius and, and Clodia, and way back in the later Roman period, it was assumed that Lesbia was Clodia. So there may be elements of autobiography in Catullus's poetry, though we shouldn't assume that it's a literal depiction of what this woman was really like. 
Possibly Ovid as well. Ovid was exiled for some kind of crime. Possibly some of that's reflected in his poetry, which is all about picking up other men's women. There's no evidence either way for Propertius. Uh, some of these may be entirely fictional characters. And especially with all the, um, the sort of discrepancies and contradictions in Cynthia, that structure where she's dead and then she's alive again, they've broken up, but then they're together again. Um, there tends to be a feeling that Cynthia is probably entirely or almost entirely fictional. Um, but we can't be sure. There's absolutely no way of knowing exactly how much truth there is in any of these. Um, the poets write love poems to lovers they cannot or will not marry. So the lovers are usually married women, like if Lesbia is Clodia, that, that would include Clodia until her husband died and then she became a widow. Boys, Tibullus and Sulpicia both write about boys. So Tibullus writes... Um, poems to a couple of different people he writes to a, a woman but also to a young boy and Sulpicia writes to a, a boy a youth I should say a um, young man and then women like Cynthia who are socially unacceptable as wives uh, whether Cynthia is literally a prostitute of some kind probably not maybe <laughs> but she lives in the Subura which is a lower class and red light district um she runs around with several men, apparently, and she does not appear to be a viable candidate for an elite man to marry. So these are love poems about these very erotic, very sexual, very passionate love affairs with people who are not acceptable for various reasons as somebody to marry. And Cynthia's appearance here is often compared to and assumed to be inspired by Patroclus' appearance to Achilles in the Iliad, which we looked at in this podcast way, way back. Uh, I think it was in the second episode of the podcast. Um, and in antiquity, most uh, writers assume that Patroclus and Achilles are lovers as well. Whether Homer meant that or not, again, is not clear, but most commentators in antiquity assumed that that was the case. Uh, so... Again, the, the image of the lover coming back um, to the dead love is reused here. I've referred to a few Roman death and funerary customs during the story. Um, Cynthia complains that Propertius wasn't there to call out her name at the moment she died. This is a practice called conclamatio, or conclamatio, um, where you're supposed to be there at the moment of death and call out the name of the person as you close their eyes. And there's a couple of references to this kind of allowing them to linger a few seconds longer. So it's not that you could save their life, but they just sort of hold on for a few seconds um, as you call out their name, which is what Cynthia refers to. She's buried outside the gates, as everybody would be, until the weird Christians came along and started burying people close to where the living are, which everyone else thought was extremely strange. Um, so you would bury people outside of the city gates, usually along the roads. The closer you are to the road, the more people will see your tombstone and remember you. So the, the fancy plots, the expensive plots are by the road and then the cheaper ones are further out. Now there's that reference to a watchman shaking a split cane. Now this is presumably a reference to the practice of shaking rattles. Uh, to scare away evil spirits at funerals. And there is a blog post on this by Caroline Lawrence, uh, who wrote up a Museum of London exhibition we went to together. Um, but I did not take such good notes. <laughs> Caroline took much better notes than I did. Um, and I'll give you the reference to that blog post at the end of the, the podcast. So they would have these rattles that you would shake um, to, to scare away evil spirits. And I'm assuming... Uh, unless anyone can tell me otherwise, um, that this reference to a watchman shaking a split reed or a split cane is something similar. Um, that she's saying, basically, not only was there no one with a rattle, you didn't even have someone make the slightest bit of noise um, to scare away these spirits. The reference to mingled bone at the end, obviously it's partly a sexual double entendre, which bone on bone I'll grind there's something very sexual and also kind of gross about that <laughs> bearing in mind she's kind of 
she's a ghost rather than a zombie. I've given her more physicality than she has in the poem. Um, but with all the, the kind of the charred dress and all this kind of thing, she's a pretty gross figure at this point. Um, but it could also be a reference to mingling bones after cremation. So in the ancient world, when somebody is cremated, you are left with ashes, but also bones. Um, they did not have the type of crematorium that we have in the modern world that would completely reduce a body to ashes. There would be a pile of bones and ashes. So you could mingle the bones and the ashes of two people in one urn, which may be what she's referring to. And you can see she's she's obviously been cremated um, because there's references to a funeral pyre. Various points in the Roman world, some people were buried um, in sarcophagi, some people were cremated. Fashions tended to change um, over time, various different times and places, one would be in fashion or the other. Uh, if you're interested in details of inheritance, and especially the duty of heirs and beneficiaries, then Charles King's book Ancient Roman Afterlife has uh, quite a lot of details on inheritance systems and the duty of the heirs and beneficiaries of a will to honour or worship the manes of the dead, the divine spirit of the dead person. Um, and as I said, King's Ancient Roman Afterlife has a lot of details about that. Cynthia doesn't seem to have had much in the way of family. Um, she's yelling at Propertius, who is her lover, but technically not related to her in any formal way, um, unless they have a sort of a common law marriage understanding. But that seems unlikely. Um, but she needs somebody to leave garlands at the tomb, worship her manes, her divine spirit of the dead, um, and take care of various things. And she's yelling at Propertius for not doing it. And there are also some pretty well-researched depictions of Roman funerals, both rich and poor, in the BBC HBO series Rome, where you can see Julius Caesar's funeral happening against um, a much poorer funeral, not absolutely poor, but a sort of a lower middle class um, funeral uh, for somebody not elite. Um, so you can see some of the differences between the elite and non-elite funerals there. So Cynthia claims to have been murdered. Um, different scholars have interpreted the narrative slightly differently the the poems are fairly vague <laughs> deliberately so i have assumed that basically ligdemus wants to get rid of her because she has been screaming at propertius to sell him uh, she mentions double chains she wants him sold somewhere really unpleasant um being a slave in propertius household is presumably quite pleasant um being a slave down in the mines definitely wouldn't be um i mean Pleasant is a relative term, obviously. Being a slave anywhere is not nice at all. Uh, but there's being a slave in a household with somebody you get on with who treats you well and there's being a slave in a mine. Um, so I've assumed that Ligdemus wants to get rid of her and that Nomas, which Propertius isn't entirely clear whether Nomas is Cynthia's slave or his slave or somebody else entirely, but I've made her Cynthia's slave. Um, and I've suggested she provided the poison. Um, the poem mentions Nomas having secret poisons and guilty hands. Um, Propertius may have intended this to be a, a kind of old wise woman type who doesn't belong to either of them, but I've adjusted it slightly. Poison is usually thought of as a woman's weapon in the ancient world. Um, women obviously aren't as able to kill with a sword or with their hands. Um, it's, it's associated with women, that women, if, if a woman's going to want to kill you, she'll use poison. And any time men are accused of poisoning, it's suggesting that there's something effeminate about them. They're using this woman's weapon. Um, both of these are, say, enslaved people, probably not Roman. The name Nomas is probably Berber from North Africa, from Numidia. Ligdemus is a, also a non-Roman name. It's a pretty violent story. Cynthia's pretty violent herself. Um, but the story as a whole is pretty violent. It's a reminder of the position of slaves in Roman society where they could be beaten by masters at will. Um, they can be mistreated. They can be sold. Uh, their position is very precarious. Often you wouldn't resort to murder because if a slave murdered their master or mistress, every slave in the household could be executed for it. This law wasn't always carried out, but sometimes it was. So that was very specifically designed to 
put off slaves from murdering their masters or mistresses. Um, whether that did put them off um, in, in real life is hard to say. There are instances of masters and mistresses being uh, murdered by um, by slaves. Sometimes that law was carried out, even when it involved executing a lot of people. Although, if there were a lot of slaves in the household, nobody was very keen on that law being carried out. There are also some references here to the geography of the underworld. This is different in every source. So essentially, there's a set of kind of commonly held ideas about the underworld, the afterlife, whatever. And no two people have the same idea. And if you think about it, that's true now as well. You, you could picture something like Christian heaven and Christianity is a dogmatic religion. It has a holy book. It has specific teachings, none of which applies to ancient religion. But even ideas of Christian heaven are completely different from person to person and different people will interpret it differently. In ancient religion, there's no dogma. There's no holy book. There's no set text. There's no set group of ideas. So ideas about the afterlife are even more varied. Something I've often referred to as the cultural imagination, that there are a series of ideas that are present within the imagination as a whole of the group, and then you can play with them beyond that. Charles King would call it a belief cluster, um, that there's a set of core ideas around which people's specific beliefs and ideas vary. And descriptions of the underworld could be adjusted and rewritten by individual authors, just like modern versions of Heaven and Hell, they'll all be slightly different, written by different people. But among some of the common themes, um, we have the River Leith, which is the river that makes you forget. The River Styx is the river you cross with Sharon the Ferryman. And there are a couple of other rivers. There's Acheron, the River of Sorrow, Cocytus, the River of Lamentation, and Phlegathon, which is the River of Fire. So there's five rivers. Um, Leith, Styx and Acheron tend to come up the most often um, in the texts. And we also have that reference to the gates of sleep or the gates of dream. The Latin word somnus can mean either sleep or dream. So they could be translated as gates of sleep or gates of dream. You just have to kind of pick which one you think the author was going for. They originate in a much, much older Greek text. Um, they go all the way back to Homer, uh, which is almost a millennium, certainly uh, centuries and centuries earlier than the texts we're looking at here and written in Greek. Um, in the Odyssey, Odysseus's wife Penelope describes the gates of horn and ivory. The gate of horn produces dreams which are fulfilled and ivory produces dreams which are harmful. This may be based on a bit of a pun, uh, horn keras, produces dreams which are fulfilled, crino. Ivory, elephas, produces dreams which are harmful, elephyromai. So that's the earliest reference to this idea. And the idea is then taken up and written um, by different authors and used in different ways, but it does go very, very far back all the way to, to Homer and to Greek mythology. In the Roman world, the most famous use of it is by Virgil in the Aeneid, Virgil says that false and misleading dreams leave the underworld through the gate of ivory. And famously, he then has his hero Aeneas leave the underworld through the gate of ivory. This is very controversial because Aeneas has just seen this kind of vision or image. Uh, he's seen the future of Rome. He's seen all these future heroes of Rome who haven't been born yet at the time the poem is set. Um, and the future glory of Rome, and he's been told about how wonderful Augustus is going to be and how wonderful everything's going to be in the future. And then he leaves through the gate of false and misleading dreams. Scholars have wept blood over this. Um, I'm not even going to try and explain that at the moment, um, other than to say, you know, possibly this is Virgil undercutting Augustan propaganda, maybe. Um, but in Virgil's formulation, ghosts send true things through the horn gate and false things to heaven, interestingly, through the ivory gate. So it's it's very strange. It's very complex and nobody can quite work out exactly what Virgil is trying to say. In the context of Propertius 4.7, I interpret this as the gates being at the border of the underworld. So I've interpreted it as ghosts are coming through the gates with dreams. <laughs> 
rather than ghosts being dreams. But opinions vary. Um, other scholars would suggest that this is suggesting ghosts are dreams. Some scholars have suggested that all ghosts are seen through dreams in the ancient world. Um, opinions vary. Um, personally, I interpret it as ghosts and dreams coming through separately. Um, because I think there are a lot of ghost stories in the ancient world that clearly aren't dreams. Um, but there is a very strong connection between ghosts and dreams and seeing ghosts in dreams. So, yes, other opinions are available. There's also a reference in the poem to Kerberos. That's the three-headed dog that guards the underworld. He's being set loose. Uh, I added the detail about him howling to tell the spirits to return at dawn, but um, there is a reference in the poem to Kerberos being set loose with the spirits as they all flood out of the gates. So, I just skimmed over quite a lot of things that there are enormous amounts of scholarship arguing about, so um, I will suggest some places to read more on this stuff. Um, so first of all, translations of the poem. Uh, prose translations of Propertius Poems by A.S. Klein are available online from poetryintranslation.com. I've recommended that website before. Absolutely fantastic resource. Loads of really good up-to-date translations um, of not just ancient poems, but loads and loads of different poems. There is a good verse translation in the Oxford World Classics translation by Guy Lee. And I've quoted bits of both in the story. I've, you know, obviously I've read the poem in Latin and I've read both translations and I've sort of picked and little bits from each translation. If you've read the poems in either of those translations, you'll probably recognise echoes of them um, in the story. I mean, there's so much scholarship on Latin love elegy. Um, I don't know where to tell you to start, so I'm just going to tell you to start with my own work uh, because I have written about this poem a couple of times. It's one of my favourites. Um, so in my edited collection, Imagining the Afterlife in the Ancient World, I have a chapter. My, my contribution to that book is a chapter on Propertius. It's on specifically this poem on Propertius 4.7 as an example of using folklore um, in a literary context. And there's also a section on this poem in my earlier book, Dreams and Dreaming in the Roman Empire. Um, that was my monograph from 2013. And there's a section on this poem um, in that book as well. On funerary customs, uh, Valerie Hope, Death in Ancient Rome, a source book is very useful. That's obviously a collection of ancient sources. And uh, Hope has also written Roman Death, The Dying and the Dead in Ancient Rome, um, which is her book about uh, funerary uh, customs, but also the process of death and dying in the Roman world. The blog post that I mentioned by Caroline Lawrence is on Crazy Dead Romans, now, the URL is quite long, um, but I can tell you it's a post titled Crazy Dead Romans at FlaviasBlogspot.com. Um, so I think uh, some quick Googling is probably the quickest way to get to that rather than me reading out um, the URL to you. But it's from FlaviasBlogspot.com and it's a post titled Crazy Dead Romans by Caroline Lawrence. Uh, the book by Charles King I mentioned is The Ancient Roman Afterlife. And if you're interested in murder... Um, Emma Southern, A Fatal Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, talks about murder in the Roman world, uh, including looking at that issue of slaves uh, murdering their masters or mistresses. So if you'd like to know more about that, then I would recommend that. So thank you for listening. Creepy Classics was written and performed by Juliet Harrison. Music composed and performed by Ed Harrison. It was produced by Juliet Harrison with assistance from Newman University.